course, uh, to the league for having me tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Evan Jenny. Uh, I've been a state representative for a little bit of time now. I'm headed into my last two years. Uh, and I'm currently the policy chair for the Democratic Caucus. Uh, in the next two years, I will finish out my legislative career uh, by being one of the Democratic leaders uh, in the Florida House. Um, and, and to the Johns Committee, it, it, it is virtually unknown by, by the overwhelming uh, majority of Floridians. Uh, really, the only reason why I knew about it, quite frankly, was as my father was a member of the legislature during my youth. Uh, and the way I was raised in that household was I was never spared um, the truth about the ugliness in the world. And my father said that while, yes, he did work inside the government, uh, we also needed to be very careful uh, because the government is a very powerful, very powerful entity, uh, no matter where you are. And sometimes governments can do horrible things. Uh, and this was an example that was given to me as a child about one of the worst overreaches uh, into individuals' lives uh, that the Florida legislature uh, had ever undertaken. Um, it, it, uh, uh, it, it ranks probably just below Jim Crow laws and poll taxes, uh, maybe even more so if we're being, it, it, but it, we're talking about a tournament of the horrible at that point. Um, but it, it is an awful, awful thing. Uh, it really, the Johns Committee really reached out and touched every corner of the state uh, and like so many bad things in the state of Florida, uh, that Tallahassee played an oversized role. Uh, Charlie Johns, uh, whom the Johns Committee uh, was given its nickname from, uh, for lack of a better term, was power incarnate in the state of Florida uh, in the first half uh, of the 1950s. Uh, he was uh, made uh, Senate president by his colleagues in 19, uh, early 1953. But something happened in September of 1953 uh, that put Charlie Johns on a completely different level of power. Uh, at that time, uh, newly minted Governor uh, Dan McCarthy, uh, in September of that same year, when Charlie Johns became president, uh, was stricken down with a horrific heart attack. Uh, Governor McCarthy was only in office for nine months prior to him dying. Uh, at that point in time, we did not have a lieutenant governor position in the state of Florida. So uh, in cases when the governor was incapacitated or had passed away, uh, next up was the Senate president. So Charlie Johns, uh, less than uh, a half a year after becoming Senate president, uh, was uh, elevated to the role of go interim governor of the state of Florida for 15 months. He did run to try to be reelected. He did not win. Um, and so he went back to the state uh, Senate again. Uh, Charlie Johns was a member of what was known as the Pork Chop Gang. Uh, that was a group of legislators, about 20 to 30 strong, uh, that were fierce uh, and cruel uh, segregationists. Uh, there's no way around that. That's who they were. That's what they stood for. Um, and a little bit of a side note, um, at that point in time uh, is the period of time where we are seeing uh, the uh, racist roots in the South uh, kind of uh, being cultivated out of the Democratic Party. Um, and this was kind of one of the last fights. In fact, um, two years after uh, the Johns Committee ended its work, a decade after it began, uh, Charlie Johns' career would end by losing in a primary um, and never seeking office again. Uh, but after uh, he lost his reelection bid to be governor and he came back uh, to the uh, state Senate, uh, Charlie Johns uh, created the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee. Uh, that's the official name of the Johns Committee as it was written into statute, uh, the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee. Um, and what this committee was, uh, was in, in no overstatement, uh, was a direct offshoot of Senator Joe McCarthy uh, and his committee on uh, un-American activities. Uh, this was a direct offshoot of McCarthyism. So what happens when you mix McCarthyism uh, in with segregationism? Uh, you have this committee. Uh, you have what it stands for, and you have uh, basically who they are initially uh, going to put into their, their sites and who they're going to go after. Um, their purpose was, at the outset, an outright suppression of African-American Floridians. No more, no less. That's what they were there to do. Uh, in their minds, the NAACP 
uh, was a communist front organization. Uh, and they would spend the majority of the early years of this committee um, going after uh, the NAACP uh, and Martin Luther King's own Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, for un-American un activities. Uh, and their stated reasoning for this was that if you were African American, you were more likely to be a communist. Um, of course, their rationale seems laughable uh, at this point, uh, but this was reality in uh, 19, excuse me, uh, in 1950, let's see, what was that, four, uh, excuse me, 1956, Florida. Um, and uh, that's what they were going after. They wanted to paint the NAACP as a communist front group. They wanted to paint Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as communist front groups. And the thought was uh, they would be more easily turned to communism uh, because uh, people in the African-American community uh, were, in their point of view, more likely to be involved in crime on some level. So that would give communists something to hold over their heads. Uh, we'll see this repeated later on with a different group of people in the state of Florida, uh, but that's really how this started. Um, they were out to try to drag their heels, not just drag their heels, but dig their heels in as deep as possible and slow down the process of desegregation in the state of Florida. Uh, the Johns Committee, if you look at what they did, um, they, you can really group them, uh, the people they went after, uh, into four groups of victims and survivors. Uh, the first group were African Americans. Um, initially, uh, what they tried to do was because the NAACP uh, was uh, offering uh, free legal service uh, for people that were fighting to end segregation in the various forms uh, throughout society, uh, first picked on a man by the name of Virgil Hawkins. Um, I don't know if anyone knows who Virgil Hawkins is. Uh, I'm sure if you're an attorney in this state, you probably have a better idea. But Virgil Hawkins was the man whose court case uh, led to the desegregation of law schools in the state of Florida. Uh, he argued that um, separate could not, in fact, be equal. Um, he argued that he had every right to go uh, to law school. Uh, with uh, his white uh, eventual colleagues. Um, and so the Johns Committee uh, tried to demean him, dehumanize him in every way, shape, and form, uh, interrogating him, uh, putting him on the stand in really what amounts to a kangaroo committee in the state capitol. Uh, but luckily, the NAACP had some of the most incredible legal minds, uh, quite frankly, uh, in the entire uh, history of our nation working for them at that time. Now, after they uh, had a farce of a committee hearing in Tallahassee, they shifted their attention to specifically the Miami-Dade uh, NAACP. Uh, it was one of the largest and most organized, probably the largest and most organized in the entire state of Florida. Uh, and they took their committee uh, traveling roadshow uh, and they took it all the way down um, to, uh, to Miami. Uh, to uh, have public hearings and publicly interrogate members of the Miami-Dade NAACP um, in order to uh, uh, create more of an environment of fear and terror, uh, that there were numerous uh, segregation groups uh, outwardly hostile to any one African-American uh, that were seated in the front row for every single committee hearing. Um, this actually happened. There is... Uh, footage uh, that you can still watch. Uh, you can see them sitting in the front row uh, and the stories told by the people that were there, the lawyers and the witnesses uh, say that they were uh, uh, not very subtly threatening uh, every single person that was there on behalf of the NAACP. Uh, but what the Johns Commission didn't really anticipate was that quite frankly, they were going to be dealing with people who were infinitely smarter than they were. Um, they were a collection of pork choppers from rural Florida, and what they didn't understand was there was one individual in particular that, that I think deserves a lot of credit, even though he never really stepped into the state of Florida. Uh, but the, the gentleman that came up with the NAACP's uh, defense strategy for all of these cases uh, was a young lawyer, uh, headquartered at the time in Washington, D.C., uh, and that young lawyer was a gentleman by the name of Thurgood Marshall. 
Uh, obviously, uh, the Honorable Thurgood Marshall now rings a lot of bells, but at that time, he was a young attorney uh, really making his name uh, and starting to practice uh, at the highest levels of the court. Uh, so that's what they ran into. They ran into the brilliant mind of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, we hear a lot about Thurgood Marshall, but not very much about Charlie Johns. Uh, and I think that that fame is directly in ratio uh, to their level of intelligence. Uh, Thurgood Marshall is regarded as uh, one of, an, an American icon uh, for, for everyone. Um, Charlie Johns is mostly forgotten and died a quiet death uh, as an insurance salesman in 1990. Uh, by the way, uh, a quick off note, prior to all of this, Charlie John's uh, most notable uh, or well-known contribution to the uh, policy scene of the state of Florida was his idea to have the electric chair uh, travel around the state, uh, and after someone was convicted, uh, you could just hook them up right there in their hometown uh, and execute them on the spot. So that was his big claim to fame prior to this. Um, there was another woman by the name of Ruth Perry, uh, who I think it's important. Um, Ruth Perry had a very precarious situation. She was the secretary of the Miami-Dade uh, NAACP at this point in time. Uh, Miss Perry was a librarian. She was a white woman from Miami-Dade uh, who believed in the cause of desegregation and equality. Uh, Miss Perry um, realized that having a book filled with the names, phone numbers, and addresses of all the members of that uh, group was probably not a good thing given what was going on in Tallahassee. It also happened that she had an eidetic memory, um, the, the uh, scientific term for a photographic memory. Uh, she literally memorized the name, phone number, and address of every single member in Miami-Dade and then shipped the actual book with all those names uh, to NAACP headquarters in Washington, D.C. So when the Johns Committee demanded that they uh, turn over the books, they couldn't. They didn't have them, but the Johns Committee had no legal authority uh, to force anyone in Washington, D.C. to give up any document. So what you had there was just a constant outmaneuvering uh, and brilliant legal minds uh, coming together to create a defense that completely stymied uh, the entire uh, uh, thrust of the Johns campaign into painting uh, the African-American community uh, as communists at a t in the middle of the Red Scare. Um, so they were able to push them back, but in the meantime, um, the Johns Committee said, well, you know, they, uh, calls of racism started being made, even at this point in time in our nation's history, uh, saying you're just being racist and going after black people because they're black, which was the real reason why. But in order to throw up some fake defense, they said, well, we're going to investigate the Ku Klux Klan after this. And this is a little bit of an unknown period of time in the Johns Committee. Um, but uh, I personally, uh, while reviewing the um, redacted files of the Johns Committee at the State Archives in Tallahassee, found a piece of paper that literally says that the Johns Committee was in contact with the Ku Klux Klan prior to going and doing their investigation, meaning that the Klan knew not to act up while they were there. Um, they basically wrote a free pass for the Klan so they could give the appearance of, of somehow being equating uh, the NAACP the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, to the Klan was somehow an even, uh, an even uh, uh, juxtaposition, which I think we all know is not even remotely close. But after that, they were kind of at a loss for what to do. Um, they had lost, they'd been embarrassed by a group of African Americans. Um, and so they were looking for a new target in the state of Florida. And they found that target initially uh, on the campus of the University of Florida at Gainesville. Um, at that point in time, uh, no one's really quite sure what turned the committee's attention to the University of Florida. Um, there is a, and I will say it's purely speculation, but there is speculation because um, uh, uh, Senator John's uh, son uh, was then a sophomore or a junior at the University of Florida, and it's believed that he said something to his father, who then came to the University of Florida specifically uh, to ruin the lives of uh, gay men. Uh, that's who he went there uh, to go after. He went specifically to go after the faculty and students of the University of Florida. 
um, to run what would today be highly, highly illegal entrapment operations, uh, interrogations without lawyers present, uh, and basically terrifying gay men uh, and bisexual men in the Gainesville area um, and uh, with the threat of exposing them to their families, loved ones, uh, and uh, employers. Um, it got very bad. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the meeting started, uh, Monica and I, uh, we were talking about a gentleman by the name of Dr. Sig Dietrich. Dr. Dietrich was uh, the, uh, he was at the top of his field. Uh, he was, a ge he, he worked in the field of geography. Uh, he was so highly thought of, in fact, that when the University of Florida started its geography program, uh, they specifically sought Dr. Dietrich out uh, to be uh, the founder and the head of that department. Um, Dr. Dietrich, most likely, uh, if we were looking at what we know today um, to be true, uh, Dr. Dietrich was probably bisexual. Um, and today, most of us wouldn't even bat an eye at that fact. But in late 1950s, early 1960s, Central Florida, um, in a lot of ways, that was more uh, detrimental and confusing than if he just would have simply been a gay man. Uh, it, because I've read through his interrogation files, and so much of it is spent based on humiliating him because of his attraction to both men and women, um, and humiliating him, um, talking about his wife. Uh, Dr. Dietrich at one point literally walked out on the ledge of his fourth or fifth floor office um, and just about jumped. Uh, and committed suicide on campus because of the interrogations that he went through. Now, luckily, Dr. Dietrich did not, did not commit suicide that day or any day after. But things got so bad and so horrible for him that he left the University of Florida. Um, and he, not to overuse the word literal, but he literally moved to the other side of the planet. Dr. Dietrich spent the next 20 to 25 years of his life in person mapping the Gobi Desert in China, because at that point it was completely unmapped, uh, at least to Western eyes. Um, and uh, he, he fled not just the town that he was in, not just the state, not just the nation, but the entire continent, uh, the entire hemisphere, um, and fled. Uh, because the pressure that they put on him was so over the top. Um, it's roughly estimated uh, that the uh, Johns Committee was responsible uh, for more than 200 expulsions and firings of students and faculty uh, in the state of Florida during this time. Um, things wrapped up there. Uh, I wish I could say that the University of Florida, my mother's a Gator, so go Gators, but I, I wish I could say they did a better job. Um, but at that point in time, the University of Florida really gave in and, and let the Johns Commission do whatever they want, um, really let them pick their faculty apart, pick their students apart, pick the local populace apart. And um, it, it really was a huge issue. Um, it, it really tore the place apart. Um, I know a, a friend of this uh, group, uh, Nan Rich, uh, Nan's husband, David, when there was an article about this, when I first filed the bill uh, uh, to memorialize the survivors, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But when I first did that, um, uh, uh, David Rich, uh, Senator Nan Rich's husband tweeted back at me that he could remember being on campus at the University of Florida in this time and having professors be there one day and then not a member of the faculty the next. And looking back at it now, they were probably caught up in this. Um, so it was, it was a horrific time there. But uh, like I said, unfortunately, the University of Florida did not really uh, step up in that moment and protect its faculty and its students from this uh, investigative committee. Uh, and an awful and dark fact um, is that the, uh, so uh, in 1958, um, some new members were brought on to the Johns Committee. Uh, one of them was a gentleman, uh, a state representative. Um, so he was there and he was on campus at the University of Florida when all this was going on. And currently the University of Florida's football stadium bears that same man's name that was a part of the committee that tore their faculty and students to shreds, uh, Ben Hill Griffith. 
Um, so uh, it, it is a bit odd. Whenever I see a Florida football game, I always think you've named your stadium after somebody um, who tried to tear apart the lives of your faculty and students, and it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I understand he drew money down so they could get that stadium built, but I, I know of uh, help. My mom went to the University of Florida. She's led a better life than him. You could name it after her, and, and you could do a lot, a, a lot worse than that. But um, after, after that time that they spent at the University of Florida, they, they moved into a third phase. Um, and this was, again, very, very specific. Uh, but they went after uh, lesbian school teachers in Hillsborough County. Extremely, extremely, extremely narrow focus. But that's what they switched up to. As you can see, they're just jumping from marginalized community to marginalized community. Uh, people that are having not to be able to live under the full freedoms uh, that, that a straight white male like myself would have enjoyed at that point in time. Uh, but going after communities that were being oppressed in many different ways, still are. But, uh, but, but at a different level and, and more openly at that point in time. Uh, but uh, so you, first you go after um, black people fighting for their rights. Uh, they beat you up. Then you end up going after uh, gay men at the University of Florida. Um, that was not a community that had any representation at that time. And, and they were really steamrolled in that instance. So they moved on to look for teachers in Hillsborough County that happened to be lesbian. Um, they were, they would go into, and we have documented cases of this, uh, where police officers and investigators from the Johns Committee would go into gay bars. Uh, there apparently there was one or two in Tampa at that time. Um, so it wasn't as if today where you have a club, a club, a nightclub that, um, that the lesbian community uh, may, may frequent. And then you have another bar down the street that, the, that gay men may frequent. And then another bar uh, where maybe trans individuals um, are, are going. It, it was everyone was going to this one place. Uh, and they would go to those bars um, and quite literally harass um, lesbian women. Uh, into trying to uh, find out uh, what teachers they knew uh, were lesbians. Um, they didn't have much luck with this. They did have some. Uh, there is a woman I'd like to bring up by the name of G.G. Mack, the initials G and G. Uh, G.G. Mack um, was at that time a bartender um, uh, at one of these gay bars in, in Tampa. And uh, Ms. Mack um, was arrested and told if she didn't give up the names of other lesbians in the community, specifically those working in schools, uh, that she would be um, thrown in jail for two years for unnatural acts. Um, that, that was a crime at that point in time. So uh, Gigi Mack, being the woman that she was and the person that she was, said, then throw me in jail because I'm not doing that. Um, she would play with them occasionally when she would be in jail and she would see uh, another member of the lesbian community um, that had been thrown into the same jail with her uh, when they came back and said, well, tell us, uh, you know, you, here's your chance. We'll let you out early uh, if you tell us who your girlfriend is and if you tell us uh, the names of other people. And what she would frequently do was after she knew the person had already been arrested, she would say, well, that person. She said, well, they just got arrested. She said, sorry, that's all I know for sure. And she only told me because she told me she got arrested. Um, so they did a lot of that, but Miss Mack actually ended up doing three years in prison, refusing to, to rat out anybody in her community. Absolute refusing. Nope, I'm going to serve the whole time. Afterwards, she got out of Tampa and she actually moved to Miami. Um, and she was quite adept, adept at um, running a print shop. And she was actually the foreman for a print shop in Miami uh, after uh, she was released. And the Johns Committee went so far, they've already thrown this woman in jail for three years, for three years of her life, gone, because she won't rat out and, and say who's a lesbian and, and who's not in Tampa Bay. The Johns Committee, she, she resettles in Miami, and the Johns Committee um, doesn't just leave it alone and say the woman served her time. Where they, they find out where she's working, call up her employer, and say, do you know what you have working in that print shop with you? Now, thankfully, I don't know who the gentleman's name was, but the owner of the print shop, his response was, yeah, I know. I got a damn good foreman working there. Don't ever call here again. 
So she was perfectly safe and ended up being the first female owner of a print shop in all of the entire Tampa Bay region by the time uh, she passed on. Um, and she would tell a story about um, the woman she was arrested with coming to her years afterwards and saying, I found out who it was that, that turned us in. Do you want to know? And Gigi Mac uh, turning her back on the potential for violence or retribution said, no, she had her own life. Uh, you know, she had her own partner and she was not going to turn her, uh, turn back the clock on that. So, um, you know, there, but there were dozens of stories like that. Now, and, and please understand we're, what we're talking about is a time frame of about nine years from 1956 to 1964, uh, uh, about eight, eight or nine years. Um, and, but they finally um, started rubbing people the wrong way. The 60s were happening. Um, it wasn't, you know, we weren't full fledged into the, uh, you know, into um, any of the social revolutions that we saw, but they were on the horizon. And that's when they decided that their next step was going to be to just cross over the bay and leave Hillsboro and get into uh, the University of South Florida. The University of South Florida had just been founded and was working on a completely different set of norms, uh, which made some people uncomfortable to begin with. Uh, one of the things that first drew them uh, into the University of South Florida was, again, this idea that communism was creeping and hiding behind every shadow. Um, but USF had an advantage that those first three groups did not have. They saw the storm coming and they were ready to protect themselves when that storm finally reached their campus. Uh, Margaret Fisher, uh, who was the director of student personnel at the time, uh, really spearheaded uh, a lot of what went on there. Uh, the faculty union got involved, uh, and they were the first group to actually not just push back on the Florida Legislative Committee, on the Johns Committee, but to punch back at the Florida, John, uh, the Florida Investigative Committee. And they did so masterfully. Uh, they were able to swing the court of public opinion significantly in their favor. Um, and what we saw there was the Johns Committee beginning to crumble at this point. We're talking about 1963. And the Johns Committee at that point, like I said, was, was, had, had run its course now for about eight years and, and public perception was really uh, starting to go. Uh, they had lost everyone except for the ultra conservative, uh, which was a significant portion of the population in Florida in the early 1960s. But um, they had lost pretty much everybody else had kind of seen through the sham that they were doing. Uh, Americans had already seen what McCarthyism had done. Uh, so they had that taste in their mouth and they didn't really care for it happening within their, the boundaries of their own state either. But the quite possibly the most beautifully ironic instance in the history of the world was how the Florida Legislative Committee uh, really imploded in on itself and ended up delivering the fatal blow to itself. Uh, you had the faculty and students pushing back and saying, we're not communists, we just don't think the same as you. Uh, because we feel that um, African American and white Americans should be treated the same with equality. That does not make us communists, that makes us Americans. Uh, so they were able to push back on that. Virtually at the same time, the, um, uh, the Johns Committee decided that they were going to put out a publication. And it was called the Purple Pamphlet. Uh, I can't see anybody's faces right now, but um, if you've heard of the Purple Pamphlet, you know where this is going. If you don't, I will warn you, we are moving out of PG into PG-13 at this point. Um, the Johns Committee produced a document, and it was a pamphlet, and the color was purple, um, documenting softcore gay pornography. The state of Florida produced a pamphlet in which there were dozens of soft pictures of softcore gay pornography. These things ended up as far away as gay men's bookstores in Seattle. There's been confirmed cases of these things ending up as far physically as you could get away uh, from the state capitol. Uh, and on every single copy is printed, printed by the Florida Legislative Investigative Committee. 
Once this got out, they lost any semblance of a base that they had. So not only have you aggravated everyone um, that doesn't like the McCarthyism, now the people who are enjoying McCarthyism are upset because you've essentially printed on taxpayer dimes gay pornography. Um, so at that point, there was a media firestorm. They managed to kind of become the turtle, um, bring their arms, their heads in, lay there, wait for things to die down, and then quietly not renew the Johns Committee. So it was this combination of multiple losses and victories, unfortunately, that the legislative, investigative legislative committee had, uh, and then their own doing by creating this purple pamphlet um, that really, um, for 1963, uh, was not the norm on any level. Uh, but like I said, you can go look this all up on your own. I, I am glossing over a lot here, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, because quite frankly, uh, I was able to work on my, uh, excuse me, my memorial. And, and that's kind of where I come into this, this entire equation, even if it's, and I understand that it's just tangentially. Um, but I wrote a memorial two sessions ago. It is yet to be heard in any way, shape, or form in the legislature, honoring the survivors uh, of this legislative committee, honoring the African-American folks who's had their lives destroyed and torn apart in public, honoring the gay men and lesbian and, and, and bisexual men and women uh, who had their lives torn apart by this, and honoring the faculty members that because they thought differently, uh, they attempted to tear their lives apart as well. Um, and, but in order to do that, I knew I wasn't a, by, uh, by trade, I, I am not a historian. Um, so in order to combat that, I reached out um, to academics throughout the South. Um, there is a wonderful doctor uh, by the name of Stacy Brauchman. Uh, Dr. Brauchman is at Georgia Tech. Um, and she, uh, and if you're interested in more, these are some things that I can point you to quickly. Uh, she wrote this particular book. Um, it is called Communist and Perverts Under the Palms. Uh, it, it details the Johns Committee. This book is more of a direct history um, where you'll find in 1960 this happened, 1961 this happened, and takes you step by step. There's also another book by Dr. Judith Poucher. Uh, Dr. Poucher is retired from the State, of, um, uh, State College of Florida. Um, and she wrote a book called State of Defiance. And what State of Defiance is more talking about individuals and how those individuals impacted the whole. It gives a whole chapter on Virgil Hawkins. It, it, it discusses Ruth Perry, the librarian in Miami I talked about at the beginning. Uh, it discusses Gigi Mack. This is where I learned about Sig Dietrich and Gigi Mack uh, and their individual stories. Um, also uh, reached out to and was working with um, two professors in the uh, film department at the University of Central Florida, uh, Robert Casanello and Lisa Mills. Uh, and if you Google um, the committee, PBS, uh, there is a half hour documentary that you can view for free at any time online. Uh, I believe it's on YouTube as well. Don't quote me on the YouTube, but I know if you just Google um, uh, uh, the committee, PBS, um, you will be able to find a link. It's 26 minutes long. Uh, and it is a very emotional 26 minutes uh, about what the Johns Committee did specifically to the gay community uh, in, in, at the height of their uh, persecution uh, from said committee. Um, that is really uh, kind of my, my 40 minute presentation uh, on, this, on this subject matter, but I can talk about a lot more detail. So if anybody has any questions, I really just kind of want to open myself up to any questions, whether it be about the historical, uh, the significance, any, any specific details that you might want more information on, uh, where the committee, uh, where our, uh, excuse me, our memorial bill currently stands and what our plans uh, are with it in the future. Uh, I leave myself open to any and all questions that the, you, you, you folks may have. Would you, would you tell us the name of the authors of those two books? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the book, um, uh, State of Defiance, and let me see, so I don't blur it too much. Uh, okay. But you see right down, oh, wrong way. I can't really see it. Okay, I'll just tell you. It'll probably be easier yeah. to tell you. Um, <laughs> State of Defiance, that's the one that looks at the individuals and how they affected the whole. And that is by a woman by the name of Judith Poucher, P-O-U-C-H-E-R. 
Perfect. And that is on uh, the university. Both of these books are on uh, University Press of Florida is the, uh, is the uh, publisher. Um, the second one, and, and that is more of a direct history um, detailing of everything that occurred. And that is uh, by a woman by the name of Dr. Stacy Braukman. So that's S-T-A-C-Y. Mm -hmm. uh, and her last name is Braukman. B-R-A-U-K-M-A-N. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes. And then the, and then the, um, and like I said, the, the documentary, if you don't have the time and a lot of people don't to pick up a 250 page book and, and, and read a history on this, uh, there is, like I said, the committee is a great, uh, is a great little documentary. It's 26 minutes long. So, uh, you, you can get through it quicker than you can get through. Um, I'll, I'll speak to my personal, uh, bad te television taste, uh, 90 Day Fiance. You can, you can watch that before you can uh, watch an episode of 90 Day Fiance. So I see Denise Elliott has a, her hand raised. Yeah, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Monica. Um, hi, uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us anything about uh, the Johns Committee's work in Broward County. Yes. I grew up here. My parents moved to Broward County in 1957 um, I actually recall hearing about things at, at the University of Florida, and I started um, school at the University of um, South Florida in 1964, so oh, I sort of lived through most of this. Yes, ma'am. Um, but I recall briefly, because like I said, I was in high school, but I recall things going on in Broward County. I yes. don't know if it was meetings of the Johns Committee yes. or and, investigations. Could you, you speak you about that at all? Absolutely, absolutely, and I and I did. I forgot. I do have a. My, I forgot that one little bullet point that I had in there, which was to say this: throughout all of this, uh, throughout all of this, what we were seeing um, was the investigation didn't just weren't just going on in the places that I I referred to. It was happening everywhere, all over the state. There were investigators that were going out and, like I said, really committing entrapment on, on a lot of individuals, uh, if you see some of these investigative reports. Um, but yes, they were here in Broward. They were in Orlando. They were in Jacksonville. If you name it, they were there for some period of time over the course of that decade that the committee was in existence. But yes, you're absolutely, and thank you for bringing that point up because I did forget to mention that, was that it wasn't just these four big blocks of this investigation where you can just neatly say, for two and a half years, they did this, for two and a half years, they did Their tentacles were everywhere throughout the entire state. It didn't matter where it was. I was picking up random, and, and sometimes what I would do, because like I said, I, I took the time to actually go through these bank boxes, these about 30 bank boxes of all these investigative reports that have been, the names have been redacted, but I'll be honest with you, they missed some of those names in the redaction. You can figure out who these people are. But yes, they're all over the place, um, setting up shops in, in seedy motels, uh, basically going around uh, trying to entrap people. Uh, you know, the post office found that there was a bit of a titillating magazine and it was going to go to John Smith's house in, in Hollywood, Florida. Uh, you know, and they would then show up at John Smith's house and say, hey, buddy, we know you ordered this magazine. It's illegal, number one. Number two, we now know you're gay. Number three, do you want your family and friends and your employer to know about this? You know, the answer is no, you don't want them all to know. Okay, then you're going to give us the names of five, six, seven, eight, however many gay men um, that you can tell us about, and you're going to rat them all out. Otherwise, we're going to pay a little visit to your employer. Um, this was very much the norm, and it was happening everywhere, including right here in Broward County. Uh, without a doubt. Thank you for bringing that up because I did forget to make that point. Yeah, one of the one of the things I remember in high school was that purple pamphlet. That was a big scandal um, among was. the teenage boys at the time. Um, but uh, obviously, you weren't allowed to have one. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, but everybody knew about it. <laughs> yes. No. No. It it was a big deal, and it really it. Never so gloriously have I ever seen someone shoot themselves in the foot. It was, you know what I mean? It was, they, they undid the, all the evil and horror that they, you know, just wreaked upon, wrecked upon the entire state. And at the end of the day, they're the ones that blew their own foot off, you know, and, and that's what happened. So I do think there is something, you know, literary about that beginning and the end. It, I, the snake ate its own tail at the end of the day. What goes um, around comes around. 
it really did in this particular instance. It doesn't, you know, it, 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 it's still for everyone that had, the, you know, the, the, the hundreds of African Americans and, and allies of African Americans who had their lives turned upside down, the, you know, the thousands of, of gay men and women that had their lives ruined, the, the hundreds of faculty members at, at multiple statewide institutions, um, you know, it just, the list goes on and on. There were a lot, a lot of people. And, you know, one of the letters, I, I got a letter once um, uh, on YouTube. If you look up John's committee, there's a Vox, uh, a Vox uh, short documentary on it that I'm in for a couple seconds. Um, and it, uh, you know, they, they talked to an, a gentleman who now lives out in Palm Springs in California, uh, who was a direct victim who had been interrogated and they went and they talked to him and he wrote me a letter afterwards. And he said, when I, when he first found out about my bill, his initial response was almost angry at me because what does it matter? I went through this and nobody cared. And then it, it, and the gentleman, so you understand the gentleman's 90 years old now and or in his 90s i forget his exact age but and then in the letter so it starts off like i'm angry at you and then it goes on and it's like but then i wasn't angry at you and then i realized you're 40 years old you didn't do this to me you found out about it and you think it's horrible and you want to shine a space so it was this we it was just it was great to see just somebody whose life had been ruined and he fled to the other side of the country over it and just watch how he processed what I was doing. And, 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 and I understood and I wrote him back and I said, I get it. I, I said, it was, I didn't do this lightly. Um, you know, but it, look at the end of the day, it was a straight white male Democrat that did this. That was at the head of this. I'm a straight white male Democrat. If anybody's going to say, sorry, it better damn well be me in my personal opinion. If somebody's going to do that officially, um, it's going to be difficult to get this bill heard. Um, it makes these subjects make a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, myself, I don't find them. It's history. I, I did not have a part in it, but I can do my best to make sure it never happens again. And that was really the intent with this bill. Um, a lot of what we see going on right now is a lot of persecution of the other, whoever that other may be, um, to the point where for some people it's become acceptable collateral damage that infants are put on trial um, because their parents weren't born in this country, literal infants being placed on trial, um, you know, and, and within that environment, um, I, I, I think I have a responsibility as an elected official representing nearly 160,000 Floridians in the south end of Broward County that I have a responsibility to them. And having grown in this community, I know what is tolerated in this community and what is not. And that type of behavior in the years I've been elected and right now is not tolerated. There may be some people that will try to tell you otherwise, but that's not the case. That's not the case with everyday folks from Broward. Representative Jenny, how did you find out about this? Well, in all honesty, I, 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 there's part of me that feels genuinely guilty about this. Um, my dad was in the state Senate from 1976 to 1997. Um, 19 and, and, you know, so he was in college in the late sixties. So the John's committee, the John's committee, uh, like, like, uh, you were saying earlier, Denise, you know, you were going into that environment at UCF at that time, right after the John's committee was on their way out the door. Um, and he was in college at that same exact time. So he had known very, you know, and he had known about it and what had taken place. Um, so just, uh, and I'm incredibly thankful and grateful to my parents. They never sugarcoated anything with me for even from an early age. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is poor behavior. Um, and my being, having my dad be in the legislature and have to go back all the time, he would explain his job to me as best he could to a two, three, four, five-year-old. Um, and why he was going up there and why it was important that he did that. And one of the examples would be if you don't have people that are willing to stand up and do the right thing, very bad things can happen to people. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be raised in Broward County at a point in time where I grew up around black folks. I grew up around Hispanic folks. I grew up around white folks. I grew up around my, my first babysitter was a gay black teenager because it was who my mom is my mom's favorite student from when she taught at Lauderdale Lakes middle. So I was, I was exposed to things at a very, very early age. And they, he told me about this very early on in my life, you know, that this was an example of bad things. And he would use examples. He would say, you know, your friend, and then insert the friend I had in school that was black. They wanted to make sure that he couldn't and his parents wouldn't be able to vote. 
Now, why would you do that to my friend and his parent? You know, he would make it personal for me, even though we were at a different time and in space at that point, but he would make it personal and say, we can't slide back on this. And there's reasons why I go up there because it, it, you don't want these other people with their hands on the, le on the levers of government because bad things can happen. Very, very bad things to a lot of people can happen. So he told me about it early on, but the thing that I'm embarrassed about is the fact that I was in the legislature for 10 years and didn't think to write this bill until two years ago. That's what I'm embarrassed about that I could have been working on this and maybe gotten it passed years ago, but I didn't do it because for whatever the reason, it just didn't come into my mind to do it. But then all of a sudden it just, whatever, you know how the mind works. It's it just that mental, those gears just, and all of a sudden it just clicked in the place that nobody knows about this. And I remember that feeling being completely justified when a week after I had filed it for the first time, it was during the inauguration period. Uh, Governor DeSantis was to be about, uh, about to be inaugurated. And the State Museum of Florida has a branch inside the old Capitol. And they put posters up around the Capitol saying, hey, here's the exhibitions we have. And it was an exhibition on inaugurations. And who is the poster boy front and center on the inauguration page? Damn Charlie Johns in a top hat and tails and it's like, hey, isn't this cool? And I remember thinking, if the people putting the posters together at the F State Museum of History don't know who Charlie Johns is and what he is known for, abhorrent homophobia and racism, we got a real problem. Nobody knows about this if the State Museum doesn't realize what they just did. And I even, in my own little form of public protest, we called them and said that I'd found, I, I didn't appreciate it. Um, I uh, then uh, took a uh, stack of post-its, wrote Charlie Johns was a racist on each post-it. And then every time I would go downstairs, I would slap it on his face again until somebody would tear it off. Um, just as a f little form of social protest inside the Capitol beyond my scope as a legislator. But but, can you tell us what other um, of, your, of your colleagues in the legislature have uh, expressed support for your bill? Yes, uh, very much so. I can tell you that my caucus is on, I've even gone, I'm going into my last two years. Uh, I have already found a sponsor that if I'm not able to pass it these last two years, I'm going to be handing it off to another legislator. And then that legislator will hand that off until we get this done. And I just hope that either if these next two years while I'm there, it can get it done. But if I can't, I am looking forward to a return trip to Tallahassee just to sit in the gallery and watch that bill, uh, that memorial finally pass. Um, but yes, no, uh, a lot of people are there, but, but I'm not going to lie. There is, I was told at one point in time by a committee chair, not the committee chair in charge, that one of the reasons that this bill probably wouldn't get heard was because the powers that be in Tallahassee were worried that some of their own members would vote against it and put everyone else and make them all look like, you know, look them, make them look like homophobic racists. Um, and they were, that was one of the reasons why the bill was not going to get a hearing was because they had members they knew would stand up and say, we need more of this in government. And even with the modern Republican Party, you know, some of the elements within their party, not all, but some of the elements within their party, um, you know, they, we have members, uh, look, uh, we, have, we have a member that, uh, he actually, he just got, he's still a member, but he got defeated in his reelection bid that laughed out loud. And there's an audio recording of it, of him laughing out loud at the suggestion from a constituent that he try to pass a bill that would make it legal to stone gay men to death. Oh, laughing on, they have him going, <laughs> chuckling about it. Like it was funny. Um, and, and I know that's who they were talking about along with a couple other members, uh, but they were genuinely concerned that it would turn into an eruption on the house floor and sometimes that outweighs whatever good comes with a bill you know it it it, it, it was something that was told to me very bluntly by someone who i respect at least they came to me and let me know what the hang-up was i disagreed with it but at least they had the gumption to come and say to me we're worried our people are so cro magnon that they're going to make a mockery of us and how we feel, and we can't allow that to happen. So sorry, but your bill's not going to get a hearing this year. 
And then I've heard somebody else say, we've apologized to enough people for the, for the time being. Yeah, and, that, and that's because we apologize to the Dozier boys for being murdered. I don't know if you know the story of Dozier Correctional Facility in the Panhandle. Uh, there were uh, a lot of young men, mostly black, but some white as well and Hispanic, uh, that were murdered and buried uh, on the campus and where their families were told they ran away from the institution. Uh, the bodies were found recently. Um, look, I've been on the floor when we were talking about simply paying the money for the unknown bodies to have a proper burial, literally. And I watched a member say that they were gonna vote from it and say it was too much money because he did a Google search and here's how much a coffin costs and why are we giving these people more money? And that was to bury children that had been murdered by state employees. We, and they didn't even wanna do that. So uh, it, 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 it's odd because there'll be times, I, I just had a wonderful conversation with the incoming speaker of the house scientific, trying to make sure our organizational session doesn't come and in, turn into a su uh, COVID super spreader event, taking it very seriously and very scientifically. And I'll have that conversation. And then I'll pick up Twitter and I'll see some goon on there, uh, basically threatening to shoot black protesters. And he's also a member of the Florida House of Representatives. So it, it, it can be, you know, it can be, I, I love the bill. Uh, I will it's the only thing I'm carrying for the last two years. Um, I'm not carrying any substantive bills other than this, um, just because I spent so much time writing it and it's just something that, that I've, I've grown attached to. I mean, I always preach to our freshman members, your, your bills are not your children. Please do not treat them as such when someone critiques them. Um, but, uh, you know, but I still, even at going into years 13 and 14 in the legislature, I still get that, you know what I mean? When, when you've spent that much time, I've spent hours on the phone doing edits with, with uh, you know, d doctoral level uh, r historical researchers, uh, you know, passing notes back and forth and, and editing them and then going back to them and saying, please don't be mad, I edited you, but here's why I did. And so just the amount of time that I put in, um, you know, this one is one that I, I just wanna do. I, I just, I don't know, I feel some weird personal attachment to it just because I think it is so unknown. And when I tell people these stories, you know, when I started in the legislature in 2006, there had never been an openly gay member of the legislature, um, not one. Uh, I now have the privilege of su uh, serving with three, uh, a woman from St. Pete, um, a gentleman from Orlando, and, and my buddy from just to the south of me, soon to be Senator Chevron Jones. Um, you know, I have that opportunity now. And, and, and just in 2006, we, I, I didn't have that opportunity. So it's just important to me. I've got too many people in my life that I care, respect, or love that happen to be um, you know, African-American. They happen to be gay. They happen to be lesbian. They happen to be bisexual or transgender. Um, I just have too many people I love and respect, and, and it's something that I want to push for for them on their behalf is so that they don't ever have to go through this. I've, seen, I've had too many gay male friends of mine hold up a telephone and show me their victim pictures. They were jumped when they were beaten within an inch of their life. Um, Representative Carlos Smith, and the only reason I bring up Carlos is because he's been incredibly open and honest about it and, and shared publicly about it. Otherwise, I wouldn't tell his story for him, but he's, he's done so. Um, you know, Carlos was beaten badly by a couple of homophobes. Um, you know, violent homophobia and um, anything I can do to tone that down um, and, and, and normalize what it means to be in the LGBTQ community, to normalize to white America, uh, what it means to, to be a member of the African American community. Um, and I want to be able to try to bridge that gap. And, and that's a role that I've played. You know, I have, I have a Interesting, when you look at the demographics of me, I, I'm kind of a weird outlier. Um, I am a straight, male, non-Jewish Democrat. Um, there are only three of us in our caucus of 47 that, that fit those particular boxes. So I feel that I have a personal responsibility to reach out to every group um, to, to try to do my very best so that we're all on the same page and we all realize that it's, if it's bad for them, it's going to be bad for us. Cause I got news for you. They don't, you, you don't, 
you don't build a cage for just one person. You build that cage for multiple uses. And who might be in that cage now, when they're done with them, there's a very good chance you're on the, you're on the menu come next, next go around. Um, and, and trying to make people understand that, that, that just because you're not black, it doesn't mean that a commission isn't going to be formed to come after you. Just because you're not gay doesn't mean that you're not going to be next uh, for a horrible, horrible invasion of privacy and the destruction of your life. Um, if they can set their sights on, on a different group, just because they're different, there's something different about each and every one of us. Um, and, and eventually you're going to have your time uh, in that scope. And, and, and I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I'm just going to um, interrupt just a moment. Is, are there any more questions? I mean, personally, I could probably listen to you all evening talk about this. Oh, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. And, and I understand it. We look, we had, a, we had a solid hour. This is a good time. Yes. Oh, it, it's, it's been very, very sobering. Yes, I'm so, and, and please, my apologies. Uh, the next time you have me speak, we can do something. We can do something a lot more fun. I'll find. So, I'll, we'll do nothing but highlight good legislation that passed after session. The next time I come back, and that, and then that way it doesn't have to be so sobering. Um, and, and look, it is what it is. It, it is depressing, but I, I like I said, I just I think we have a responsibility as a people and as a society and as a culture to look these things in the eye unblinkingly with the full knowledge that staring into the abyss can turn you mad. Um, but, but I think it's important as a society that people do that. Um, and, and that's what this bill is to me personally. Okay, thank you. Are Absolutely. there any questions out there in, no? Well, okay. thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for coming. Well, thank you. I really, really, really appreciate your speaking about this topic. Absolutely. Oh, and, and if I can, what I'll do right now, um, if anybody has, if anybody thinks of any um, uh, follow up questions or anything that they need, um, what I'll do right now um, in the uh, chat box uh, to the side, um, I am putting down my office phone number. Uh, please feel free, give us a call. And if anybody thinks of anything else that they have a question about, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't hesitate, give me a call, let me know, uh, and we'll get an answer to you as soon as humanly possible when we're not trying to help people get unemployment compensation. Okay, and I have uh, sent you an email with um, Patty Reed's um, email. Awesome, awesome, so thank, you. thank you. Well, thank, thank you, thank you for everyone. the question. Um, you got it. We're all clapping just virtually. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank Absolutely. you and get out there and make sure everybody's voting. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye. <laughs>